1965 VW Restoration, Part 4. I wanted to go back over this uh, shift rod bushing installation. I didn't go into detail on that, and I'd like to. So here's what you do. First, you need to remove the shift rod as shown here in the photo. Remove the shifter and the plate from the tunnel. Remove the inspection plate underneath the rear seat and disconnect the shift rod from the transaxle at the coupling. This shift rod has to come out through the front of the car, so remove the inspection plate on the front of the bulkhead where the axle assembly bolts. And then remove the inspection plates on the car body itself so you can pull that shaft out through the front of the car. There is a video on YouTube by Boosted VW that shows how this is done. But I would do it a little bit different than he's done it in that I would pull this shift tube out by running a wire all the way down the tunnel from the front and looping it around the shift rod tube or wire tying it with a wire tie. If you wire tie your wire to the shift rod tube, bend a little crook in the end of it. Then you can pull that shift rod tube out far enough to install the new bushing. You may want to pull this tube all the way out and clean it real good and put some grease around it over oh, the first eight or ten inches or so, enough to go into the bushing. So now let's install that bushing, okay? The left side of the bushing, as shown here in this photo, goes to the front of the car. Grease this bushing good and slide it into the bracket on your tunnel to where the groove is on the bushing. Once you start installing that rod into the bushing, the bushing will be expanded enough to where it won't come out of that bracket. You can do this without help by raising that shift rod with a wire hook until you get it started into the bushing and then take a pair of pliers and get it started through the bushing then go to the front of the car and push the rod with a broomstick till you get it in place all the way and basically that's it like i say you can watch videos on how this is done but this is the way i did it and again here is this bracket that the new bushing slides into with a clip to the front I have a lot of sandblasting to do here. Of course, you want to plug all your tubes or tape them to make sure you don't get sand in them. Meanwhile, I have this steering wheel ready to paint. Dropping the front axle assembly out where I can sandblast and clean all this up and get it ready for paint. Here's the jack adapter I made that works on both front and rear, and you can also see the hole to the left where that shift rod comes out. On the front of the body pan where this adapter is bolted, in under that there is an inspection plate that you remove to get that tube out. You'll see it. Degreasing this front end, scraping all the old grease off and using a degreaser and then a pressure washer and then a sandblaster. And I'll clean up the steering box, sandblast it, get it ready for paint. I took the speedometer home with me where I could work on it in a good clean place and take my time to restore the speedometer. And at the top you see the old lens that was broken and you see the lens to the left that are new from Wolfsburg and they're called gels. And here are all the parts to that speedometer disassembled. This speedometer case is crimped together, so take a small screwdriver and work around that crimp, expanding it a little bit until you're able to take the speedometer apart. You can see here where the old lens, or gels, as they're referred to, were glued. I used some clear, all-purpose vinyl glue. And this, of course, is the speedometer housing, which I cleaned up. On the Samba Forum, some say they like to use a double thickness of this gel, and that's what I did. 
shine a light through it and see what you think. The left red is for the generator and the right green is for oil pressure, which doesn't make any sense to me at all. Clean your glass in the face of this speedometer very carefully before you put it back together and check to make sure you have no lint. Now here's what they actually look like with a flashlight behind them. Well, my son and grandkids came to see me today, so I'll leave this photo in there. Yep, that's me, the old man. I started this restoration in September 2013, and here it is New Year's Day. I've been working four, sometimes five hours a day. And I've got the engine all ready. Four or five hours a day is plenty enough for me. Okay, I have the front axle ready to paint, and those rubber snubbers are worn. They'll have to go. I wash these window regulators out in my parts washer and put new grease in them and uh, make sure that they worked fine. I use luber plate to lube this drive spring. You can remove that drive spring completely if yours is uh, rusted too bad. These were fairly clean and in good shape, just needed to be washed out a little bit. If you sandblast these parts, make sure you don't get any sand in your ball joints and don't sandblast your steering box seal. And doing the final body work on the underside of the front hood, just about have it right. Here I'm going to strip the upholstery and padding off my seats. There's no need for me to go into this in detail because there's plenty of videos on YouTube about how to do upholstery, and they're all good videos. If you buy the TMI upholstery, and I bought mine from J Bugs, you get a free DVD on interior installation, and it's an excellent DVD, only it doesn't cover the three-piece original headliner like my 1965 uses. I wanted to keep my car as original as I could, so I used that three-piece headliner, and I'd never done that before, and it's much harder than the one-piece. These metal barbs hold your upholstery. You'll see by videos that you watch on how to do this, and of course you have a metal rod which I had to replace mine because it was so rusty. But you have a metal rod that goes over the barbs too. All that's covered in videos. Chris Fallone at Classic VWs also has some good videos on upholstery installation. And you start off with burlap over your springs and you use these hog rings as they're called and hog ring pliers to uh, Hold the burlap to the springs, and here's the hog rings. This is what they look like if you've never seen them before. And the metal rod goes through the uh, stitched loop on the upholstery as you see here. One thing that most videos don't mention is that you need to uh, inspect your seats real carefully for any broken places like uh, this photo. So be sure and weld any broken places you see. Someone had put a very large bolt through the seat frame and I needed to make a spacer to put it back stock to weld that spacer into the frame. So this is what I made to weld back in that large hole. All this will have to be sandblasted. And I recommend using these seat buns as they call them, pre-made, pre preformed buns. Uh, I used foam rubber, but unless you've done it before, you might want to use the buns. They make these seat buns in horsehair, which is actually coconut fiber, or you can buy the buns in foam rubber. I had a severely damaged corner of a fender that I had to build up with a little bit of weld. I'm going to weld that spacer that I made into this seat frame. Now it's welded in and the wheel's ground down. The steering wheel's painted and I also painted it with two coats of clear. Now if this spray can paint doesn't hold up, it's no big thing. I'll pull the wheel off and shoot it with the PPG paint.
and you can see a dent in this seat frame where the seat frame was stuck and somebody took a hammer to it. You could braze that in or you could just use some body filler. More than one dent in these seat frames. There were many splits on these fenders. They had to be widened with a cut off wheel and then filled in with weld. All splits need to be widened to an eighth inch or so. Here I've had to reinforce the edge of a fender. So many splits and these splits need to be cleaned up on the back side as well for a show car. Here's another place to be repaired on the bottom edge of a fender. My left rear fender had way too much body filler in it and I had to remove that body filler and work those dents out better with a hammer and a dolly. I had to cut this brass out between the two holes in the rear fender and make a new piece for it. Of course these holes must be the exact right size and proper location for your grommets. Remove any places that have been brazed. Clamping that piece in for welding. Magnets made for this purpose work well too. I use those a lot where I can't get a clamp in. This is starting to look better. Be sure your seat adjusters are clean and work freely. My seat locking projections were broken off. And so here is the way I repaired that with a plate and screws. If they're spaced properly, this works real well, and that plate is pop riveted to the seat frame. At this point in the restoration, I decided to go all the way down to the bare metal, sandblasted all the way down to the bare metal. Sandblasting with my small sandblaster takes a lot of time, but that's one thing I have plenty of, time. Mask and tape any areas that you don't want sand in. You don't want sand in a transaxle. There's not many people alive today that know how to use body lead. I learned it years ago back in the 80s, and I'm having to relearn it now. But it works real good in some places. Body lead will give you far more strength than fiberglass filler. Should you decide to learn how to do lead, Eastwood has lead and all the associated products. Shown here is a body file. It is basically like a large sharp file, big teeth. And here's a stick of body lead. Now the trick to body lead is this. After you get the area tinned, which means covered with solder and you wipe it on with steel wool, then the real trick is to melt that bar of lead onto that tin spot but not to get your heat too much or it'll fall right off. You have to catch it at just the right time with a paddle to smear it on that fender. It's a very tricky process. But on the edges of the metal like door jams, nothing is stronger than lead other than weld itself. And here I'm working on the edge of a door jam. And I don't need to tell you that lead can be hazardous to your health, so wear a mask. Sandblasted this front axle. Going to prime it and paint it. Here's a front end alignment tool I made out of water pipe. One piece slides inside the other and locks. And you scribe a line on the tire and go from there. I found a bad dent in the right front edge of the door jam. That right front door, the front edge and the cowl had been hit at one time. I had to straighten it using a porter power as you see here. You have to be careful doing this though. You don't want to push a den in the other side of the door. You may have to use a little heat to kind of coax that den out. Here's an area with body lead that's almost perfect now. And here's an area that's been leaded in and partially worked down with that body file that you saw a photo of a few minutes ago. More work on those areas. This is the left rear fender I mentioned that had quite a few dents in it and thick body filler. I've removed that body filler and just about have this fender ready. I decided to sandblast this front axle after I had cleaned and repacked the front wheel bearings, new seals, new wheel cylinders, new brakes. 
so all the holes have to be taped off carefully to keep sand out of the brakes. There are paint removal wheels, which I'll show a little bit later in this video. I've taken those wheels and removed the biggest part of the paint on the left-hand side, and I have sandblasted the right-hand side. Sandblasting the right-hand side took about two hours, but I decided to do it myself rather than send it to the man that sandblasted my wheels. Now here is the right cowl area that I mentioned had a dent in it, and that dent was so deep it had Bondo about an inch thick. And so there's no way to get to the back side of this dent to work it out with a hammer and a dolly. So I'm going to have to cut this out, really, to do a nice job. On a restoration, you just don't want a lot of thick body filler. I couldn't do that in good conscience. And here, the badly dented portion of that cowl area has been cut out. And I'll make a panel out of 20 gauge black iron to fit. You can cut a piece of cardboard to fit using the cardboard as a template. That's one good way to make sure you make an accurate panel. Remember, you want an eighth inch gap all the way around this panel for your wheel to go in, not on top of. And there's a little rust in the corner of that door jam that'll have to be fixed too. All this is really not unexpected for a car 50 years old. There was a hole all the way through this door jam and that had to be filled. And that damaged area of the door jam filled with weld because that really has to be strong in that door jam. You don't want to just use body filler. In an area where you have a double panel, you may have to cut an access to it to straighten the dent out some and then weld your access back up. And that was the case here. I had dents so severe in that door jam that I needed to knock most of them out. So I did that. A professional body man would use a welded stud puller on this to pull that dent out. But like I say, I'm not a professional body man. Okay, finally welding the new panel in. Remember to take your time at this and bounce around to keep the heat down. In hard to reach areas like this, you really need a die grinder or a Dremel tool with burrs, carbide burrs, to work this metal down. You can't reach it any other way. And I grind the wells down on the panel, being careful not to get it too hot in doing so, and looking at where I need to re-weld. Now this takes time and patience especially when you've never done it before. You know, this is a learning experience for me. I've never made and welded panels in before. Like I said before, I think these are the original factory markings, assembly markings at the factory inside the trunk. I took a photo of this to save it. I kind of hated to lose those factory markings, but this trunk had to be painted. There's no question it had never been painted before, and there were some dents at places that needed to be welded up. You can see how rusty that firewall is, so that needs to be sandblasted and epoxy primed too. As I said earlier, I finally removed this wiring harness. It was just in the way too much to try to work around it, and it only takes a few minutes to remove it. Some minor dents on the front edge of this apron accumulated through the years. Now this photo is a good photo showing where you have to remove that shift tube. There's two panels go right through. You can see my jack through the holes. Now with all the fiberglass filler removed, you can see how many small dents are in the front of this apron. I'll remove those. The grommet holes in this apron need to be repaired too. I was actually surprised there was no damage to the rear apron. Very slight damage. And back to do the finishing touches on the steering wheel. It looks real good. I'm happy with it. You know, I try to respond to everybody's messages, but for some reason, uh, I can't respond to messages on YouTube, and I don't have the time or patience to figure that out. I've got too much to do. 
So if you ever have questions, I'll certainly try to answer them. And you, one way of contacting me is by Facebook, Bill Tate, Lenore, North Carolina, Facebook. Private message me, and I'll do my best to answer any questions that you may have. Thanks for watching my videos.